So just a welcome to everybody who's joining us. It's really great to have you. We're hosting uh, this meetup out of Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, it's really great to be able to meet together like this and be a global community like this, even though we kind of all around the world experiencing some things together. Um, I just want to start this session by giving a quick introduction, a few minutes, then Esther is going to take over on the topic that, uh, that you came here for. So uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, cool. So I, I just want to provide some context and then some information around how this will go. So we, we're talking about, uh, today we're talking about running uh, Mendix on top of uh, AWS. All right, now you might be saying, uh, why would you run Menix on top of your own cloud when Menix already offers uh, such a good product out the box as is? Um, you know, and that might puzzle you as it does this guy right here. Um, and some of the reason is in, uh, in the answer that we give, which comes from uh, Wardley, uh, Simon Wardley, who uh, he actually attended the 2000, I think it was 2016 Menix World. So if you, if you guys are there, maybe you have actually heard this talk, but Wardley's given the, uh, launched this uh, great um, framework called Wardley's Maps. He actually spoke about it in Mendix World. And uh, th this is kind of the context we want to present this on. Uh, so Wardley's Maps is quite a simple thing. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but he basically says, and this is an example map that I'm using to explain the point of where we're coming from here tonight. Uh, what he basically says is every business has a value chain, as many of you might even know what your value chain is. And that value chain is kind of broken apart into many components as it provides a service to your customer. And basically, you can map these components on a range. And if you look at the bottom left to bottom right, you see what is called evolution. And you see Genesis components right on the left hand side and on the right hand side, he's got commodity. And um, his theory is ultimately things gradually, gradually, but surely start sliding towards commodity. And the example is in the case of power, um, you know, we don't have to run generators. Very few companies have to run generators. Most of the time, power is utility. You just plug in what you need and you get power out the wall and it runs, uh, it runs the, the systems and the machines that really do create value in the world. And that's really the angle that we're coming from here with, with uh, Amazon and AWS and cloud hosting is really what, what um, these cloud hosting providers have, have created is a kind of computing utility and what they're pioneering is a computing utility. So you no longer have to have your own hardware or anything like that. You just rent the, the processing power that you need. You no longer need to keep file storage. You just rent the file storage that you need. And it kind of works like a, it's starting to work like a power utility. So it's, Kind of with that context, we want to uh, have this conversation tonight about what AWS is to the Mendix world and how you can how you can leverage this utility um, in the Mendix world. Uh, so I want to introduce SJ. So SJ uh, leads our, our, when I say our leads, Commotion's infrastructure team. He's been with Commotion for many years and Commotion is a business that starts other businesses and he's been with us he started literally two businesses with us from scratch. And I actually realized today uh, a third as well. He was supporting another one. And so he's really been with us for a long time through all, 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 the, all the efforts. He's well certified, as you can see. He's got professional um, architect and DevOps engineer certifications. And he's through in a Scrum Master certification just for fun. So um, I'm going to hand over to SJ soon. Uh, I've seen the talk. It's excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I just want to add one or two more things, one plug. Our next meetup we're all organizing for the end of next month is with Craig Reezy. It's going to be on how you test Menix applications. Craig is uh, also a great talker and, and, and got a lot of knowledge. So watch out for that one. It'd be great to see you there. He's going to present it in three parts, which is high level view for testing, how you get into more detail, and then finally how you automate it going forward. So he's got something for everybody. If you don't know what testing is, he's going to be able to help you with that. Um, if you know what it is, he's going to be able to help you test further right so um thank you for the people that shared the photos for us um i just want to say if you have any questions in this presentation just hit them to the panelists we'll co uh, collate them and at the end we'll have a questions and answer session that um for you and sj will answer what he can in the time that's available for that and uh so that's the end of my presentation i'm going to hand over to sj now and we're all looking forward to this talk go for it sj 
Michael, old Michael Scott. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Alrighty. So as uh, as Derek said, I'm gonna speak about uh, about Mendix and AWS and uh, how you can well how um, what the benefits of it and a little bit more information around that. Um, about me, um, all you need to know about me is that's all pretty much. Um, when I'm not working, I like to travel and go to live events, sports, that sort of thing, all the things we can't do. And if I can't do that, then I like to uh, collect these uh, six well, hexagonal little things and sometimes a ribbon. But yeah, before we begin, um, I just want to uh, mention a few things. So I know that uh, I haven't actually played around with it all that much, but I know that uh, you can these days you can set up your AWS network or AWS infrastructure as an environment um, on the Mendix portal. And I think I called private cloud and you can deploy into your own private cloud. So this is not about that. Um, it's uh, apologies if you thought it was. This is about running AWS, everything yourself and kind of sidestepping the whole Mendix portal um, to a large extent. Um, kind of the benefits that you get through that. Um, as I said, haven't played around with that. So there might be some things I mentioned here that you can actually achieve through that. Then secondly, most of, um, of what I'm gonna be discussing today is running Mendix in a container. So if you don't know what that is, we mostly use Docker containers. I think that's pretty much the type of container most people use. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know or don't uh, understand that low down, you can basically deploy your Mendix applications or the application that you built in Mendix either onto a normal server or into a container, which is basically an entity that you, deploy, uh, you, you package all your application code, application dependencies, and everything basically that your application need, including the, the underlying operating system and that sort of thing, uh, oper uh, system packages. You um, package up into a single container, and then you can ship that one single unit through your various stages um, of development. So I'm gonna talk a lot about containers pretty much. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Oh, just before, Mendix used to have a an AMI that you can in, um, run normal server instances of Mendix on AWS. They no longer have that. Um, if you still have an AMI like that, you can actually launch it, um, but you can't create new ones from that. But again, we'll, we'll, we won't be talking about those today. So these are the topics that I'm going to cover. Um, we're gonna start with citizen development. Um, then development teams as a whole, the AWS world. I'm going to look at quickly look at architecture and cloud formation um, and the power of cloud formation. And uh, yeah, we can, um, if there's time, I'm going to look at concerns and then I'll, uh, if, if there's not enough time, I'll skip directly to questions um, or considerations on concerns. Um, so yeah, let's start. If you look at citizen developers, um, I looked at, at, at the kind of the prospect of a citizen developer and, and, and how they would go about doing their work. Um, and three things came to mind that should be important to citizen developers. Um, the first thing is speed of it or fast iterations of the of the um, application. Second one is flexibility. If you want to chop and change a little bit, um, various sizes, that sort of thing. And the last one is low cost. Now, as you can see, I don't present present all that much, so I went nuts with animations and then realized it takes freaking long to do that. So I'm not going to do all these animations throughout my presentation. Um, I'll keep it civil from here on out. But yeah, so if you look at these three questions, um, you can look at them in a different way as well. You can you can ask yourself the question, what happens if my application as a citizen developer, what happens if my application um, becomes too slow or it runs or uh, becomes too popular um, or running it becomes too expensive? So in that case, you can, this depending on how you architect your, your your underlying infrastructure, you can actually address all of those issues. So looking at these specific ones, the service that comes to mind pretty much from the get-go is Fargate, AWS Fargate. Now, AWS Fargate is one of three services that AWS provide um, for you to run your uh, container. And what it does is it basically abstracts you to a large extent from the underlying infrastructure. You build your container, you give it to Fargate, and you say, I want to run this container in this specific location, and it needs this much memory and these amount of CPUs. Go. Um, you can obviously configure 
a lot more than that, but that's all you actually need for it to just go, go with it. Um, we also look um, at services, something like um, Aurora Serverless, which is a serverless database technology, which will scale in and out um, on demand. Um, there is caveats to that scaling, um, but for citizen developers, it's actually a very good um, tool for that use case. Um, so if we look at citizen developers, you, as I said, you want to abstract them as far as possible from, uh, from the underlying technical kind of side of things, from the infrastructure, from all the nitty gritty stuff, because you want them to focus on the application. So basically you can set up, get, create an environment where you build your application in the Mendix modeler, uh, you generate your .mda, your deployment package, and you let your citizen developer upload it to S3. Um, you can either do that directly to the S3 console, uh, the AWS um, S3 console, or you can actually just build a little page and you can upload the, the, the um, artifact through that page. If you want to abstract them even more, don't give them AWS access and do that through the page. What can then happen is the citizen developer can say, I want to run this version of my, of my deployment and start it up. And once that happens, you can spool up all this infrastructure on the, at the back end automatically. So essentially what you'll need is you'll need Fargate for your runtime, you'll need a database um, and ECR. ECR is Amazon Container um, Registry, Elastic Container Registry, my bad. So it's basically just a repository where you keep all these various versions of your Docker container. Um, when well, you build it with your application package, well, it, traditionally you'll build your application package into it, but if you have a citizen developer thing where, um, speed is more important then you don't actually need to do it that way. You can, you can work around it. But anyway, it's basically just a repository for your container images. So this is all you, you essentially need uh, for, as a citizen developer. The citizen developer can then upload packages, um, test it, see if it works. If it, work, if it doesn't work, make a change quickly, locally, update or upload a new package, stop the instance, start it up again. And you can even change size. You can say, I, I, I don't need two gigs of memory, actually four gigs of memory for my application or my, my database is a little bit too slow, I need to, to up it a bit. You can double, uh, with Aurora Solus, you can double um, the, the, the capacity of the, of the database quite quickly. The storage on the, at the bottom scales automatically because of the way that Aurora is architected, the, um, the service itself, um, the storage scales automatically. So it's, it's, it's pretty much perfect for this. And then uh, if, if you're not using it at all, you can either, it will either, you can set it up to kill itself to, to just, if no action is taken or there's no activity on the system, it will shut down itself or by a click of a button, you can take it all away again. So I'm gonna demo this real quick, um, or at least a part of this real quick. So um, I, I asked a, a buddy of mine to, to create a couple of index packages for me. So I've already uploaded version one of the package now. Um, this is a demo, so expect something to go wrong. Um, but basically, I wrote a little page that abstracts me from everything. Um, I have the package uploaded to S3, uh, the deployment package. So I can I can show that to you here. Um, if I go um, AWS S3, and then say uh, ls profile mendix, and the bucket is mx meet up. XM. So if we list there, um, as I said, something's going to go wrong. Awesome. Just going to do that real quick. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, anyway, you can assume that there's a package there, as I said, demo, something's going to go wrong. So there's a package. I want version one of that package and I can say run. Then basically what's happening now is the database is starting up. Uh, an application version is, is, is deployed and it's, it's, it's coming up. Um, as you can see, it's currently in a provisioning state and I already have an IP address. So this is a, 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 dyna a, a, you know, it's a dynamic IP. It's gonna change every time you start and stop this instance. You can set it up to be static. Um, in my case, it's not. Uh, it is locked down to my home address. So you can try and log in, it's not gonna work. We're just going to wait for this thing to go into into um, it's impending at the moment, so I'm just going to wait for that to go into running state. While we wait for that, I'm going to see if this thing wants to play nicely. Um, infrastructure. 
Please excuse my full destruction names. Cool. This S3. There we go. So there's going to be two buckets. This is the one I want. Bottom one. S3, come on. There we go. Okay, so there's my deployment package I uploaded earlier today. It's just called pack.md, uh, MDA, my bad. Okay, we're in running state. So if I now go and I open up a new tab, I say I want to go to colon 8080. Go. It's going to load my Minix application. Now, I have to actually log in. So let me just grab the super secure password that is hard coded in this application. Um, again, that's not best practice. Don't do that ever. Okay, here we go. It's MX admin. Just gonna log in as that admin. And there we go. Welcome to your new Minix app or whatever that is. So I've got version one of my application running. That's great. Um, I don't actually want it running anymore though. So I'm gonna stop it. Um, that's for later. That. So I'm gonna stop it. I'm just gonna copy this task ID. I'm just gonna paste it there and say stop. So this will now stop that thing. So while that stops, let's say I wanna actually upload version two. So it's a very small um, little thing. So not a problem. I'm going to say CP. And then instead of next, now I'm using the command line. Uh, you can upload these files via the console. You can build your own little page to do this. I just like the command line because it's better. Uh, just trust me, it's better. So while this uploads, it's about 20 megs. It shouldn't go all that slow, depending on. Uh, on our speeds around here. So essentially what happens here in the background, I built this little screen. It's, it's, a, it's a function that runs in the background. My, the two buttons hooks up to this function. I'm just showing you the code just to prove to you that you don't need to write a mountain of code to actually abstract people from it. This is two functions, a little switch at the top and that's pretty much it. It's all you'd really need for um, to achieve what I just did there on that page. Um, it's it's not a whole lot of code. It's not going to take you all that long to write abstractions and uh, how many packages there. Awesome. So we're just waiting for this thing to go into stop state. It is in stop state. I'm just going to clear the page. Now I'm going to say, I want to deploy version two. So I'm going to just say, go run version two for me, please. Uh, as I said, um, the, 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 the code I showed you, it, it does really, it doesn't take that long to write. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that, um, which I won't get into too much detail on that right now. Um, but essentially, it's 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 a little bit more work. There might be some maintenance, and you can even build it in Mendix, and it's not that big a deal. Um, have a little Mendix application that manages your Mendix environments. You know, create a little bit of inception for yourself over there. Um, cool. So we're just waiting for that to go into running state. It shouldn't take that long because the the package just or the previous one is just killed so the environment should still be quite warm. And there we go. So now I'm gonna to go to that new IP. I'm gonna to go to colon 80, 80. Just grab my trusty hard-coded password again. Now that should say version two. There we go, version two. Simple as that. So, I mean, that kind of demonstrates the whole uh, speed of it. Uh, you can you can obviously build into this page or just give people access to the console. You can build into this page, upgrade my environment to be twice as big. Um, and I'll get into the kind of mechanics behind that a little bit later when we touch on cloud formation. But that's basically it. it it's, it's really not rocket science. Um, 
and I just closed the wrong tab. That's going to be interesting later on. Anyway, so that was the demo. So now that citizen developers for now, I'll get into a little bit more um, detail on the te uh, technical side of it later on. But if you look at the, just before we get into development teams, if you look at the, the core questions that you ask yourself in terms of cost, you can architect it to be as cost effective as possible, go up and down to be only available when you need it and only incur cost when you actually need it. Um, in terms of flexibility, you just saw how quickly it was and how easy it was to upload a new Manix deployment package uh, and then test it out and run it. And uh, as I said, uh, in terms of that kind of covers the, the speed, speed aspect and flexibility, there's, there's a lot to that. So getting on to development teams, and I think this is where kind of most of the benefits will shine through. Um, I want to focus on three things. Here. I want to focus on quality. I want to focus on security, and I want to focus on process. So the core of a, of, of running Mendix um, in the in the cloud, and, and if you look at it from a development team perspective, the core of that will be a, a pipeline. Um, you want to put your stuff in pipelines. Um, it just simplifies deployments. It, it standardizes deployments. The it, I mean, the whole uh, idea behind it is you don't end up with environments that are uh, mis uh, mismatched or any of that sort of thing. And people don't have to, you can automate this obviously, um, but there's no need for developers to sit up at nine at night or in my case, sometimes two at night and uh, run deployments and figure out why something went wrong. So deployment pipelines, the, the heart of a deployment pipeline is pretty much the build stage. So let's look at the build stage. Um, there's, there's four kind of core things in a, in a, in a build. The first is the um, deployment of the pulling of the Mendix, uh, Mendix dependencies. So Mendix, when you build a container, so this, this build stage is specifically focused on building a container. Uh, for building containers for your Mendix application, Mendix actually provides you with Docker files that you can use to create those, those container instances or container images, my bad. So you don't actually have to go and figure out what is needed to get that runtime up and um, runtime environment up. You can actually just pull the stuff from GitHub, get it on your local machine, install uh, Docker, doc, oh, what's the local thing? Docker community edition. You can install a doc on your, on your local machine, build the packages. All you have to do is provide it with, a, uh, with your MDA package unzipped um, and it will go from and build the image. So that's all the dependencies. There is a few little things that's in there that the, the Docker file will automatically pull for you. Um, you want to pull your application code in this Docker con uh, in this build. So we pull our deployment packages from S3. You can actually pull this straight from Mendix as well from the Mendix cloud if you have access to the uh, the build API. Um, it's either the build or the deploy API. But if you have um, if you have access to that API, you can actually pull it straight from there. So you don't have to download a package or or build a package locally from the Mendix modeler um, and then up upload it yourself to S3. You can pull it just straight um, and then. You tag your, you build your container, you tag it, and you, um, you send it off to ECR. Now, I want to point out that with a with a deployment pipeline or with AWS Code Build, you can you can chop and change a lot of the components. You can use something other than Code Build as your build stage. You can use Jenkins if you want to. You don't have to use ECR. You can use whatever you want to um, for your container um, images. Um, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, there is some lock-in, not necessarily to AWS, but at least to their way of doing, but there's uh, there's a lot of choice in your uh, tool set that you want to use. But looking at this picture, there's something missing here. There's something glaringly obvious that's missing here, and that is the quality step. So what we are able to do is within our build um, step, we can actually run all of our unit tests, automation tests, code coverage tests. We can run all of that in the build stage. And by doing that, you can actually set up rules to fail a build if it's not sufficiently tested. Before any human gets to it, you have your developer, um, you make sure that your developers actually did their job properly and tested it properly before they, act, um, they go into QA and you end up with a bunch of errors and waste everybody's time. But the second thing that's missing is security. So you can actually, with ECR, there's a, um, ECR has a built-in feature that scans your, your container images. Once it's uploaded, it will automatically scan it. So all you have to do is then before you, you mark your build as a success, you, you pull that, that uh, findings, uh, you check for any critical issues um, or high or medium risk issues, um, depending on what your, your tolerance is. And if any are found, you can just kill the build once again. So you don't deploy um, 
package uh, uh, deploying packages or containers with with vulnerabilities i have to point out that this scan the ecr built-in scan it's free number one you get one scan a day per image so if you have 100 bolts it's 100 scans but one image however it only scans the underlying os packages it doesn't actually scan your your applications packages so you'll have to you know, have to implement your own solution for that which is relatively simple to do as well um Amazon checks that against an open source list of, of vulnerabilities, common vulnerabilities. So it's not just Amazon's opinion, it's it's an open source thing. So looking at a standard pipeline uh, that you will come across this is very, very basic. You have your code that's coming out of, in our case here is, is S3, or in this case, at least is S3 as your source. It gets, uh, it kicks off the pipeline either automatically, um, you can trigger it with a new package upload, can automatically trigger the pipeline, or you can just say, Upload it whenever you are ready on a schedule or when you're whenever you're ready, just click a button and deploy. If your build stage, once it's built, it will push it up to ECR. Um, and then from there, it will deploy it automatically for you into QA. Now, what happens when it deploys automatically into QA is it actually just says um, this new image that I built, when QA brings up a new container, use that image. It doesn't um, actually push anything like straight to the QA environment. Um, and you again, you can de you can decide on your your de deployment um, your deployment policy. You can either say QA whenever you bring up a new or production whenever you bring up a new um, container. It could be set up independently, by the way. Whenever you bring up a new um, container, use it. Or you can say there is a new one. I want a new one now, and it will, it will do that. It all depends on, on your use case. Then typically you would have a human intervention sign off before it goes into production, unless you have completely end-to-end -end automated deployment pipelines. Typically, you will have humans um, signing off on a, on a code on a QA stage, and then it will, again, deploy into production. This is very, very standard stuff. The interesting bit comes in, and I think this the process side of it, this obviously is does a lot for quality and for security, because before it even gets to QA, you can sort all of that out, or at least most of that out. Um, but the power of this comes when you start playing around with it. And this is where I get really excited. So let's say you use Jira um, as your, 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 your uh, project management tool. Um, this, you can achieve this with, with something like Trello as well. I'm not sure about Sprint, I haven't used it extensively. But let's say you use Jira. Uh, you have a, a card on your Jira board that says, or an issue that says, I want to, or this is the, the, the work that has to go into a deployment. If you move that card into the next stage and you say it's, it's ready for deploy or, or go into deployment, that action can actually trigger a pipeline deployment in your AWS environment. Um, you need a little bit of setup for that uh, in terms of just an endpoint that will listen for that, that, that action. It's very simple to do though. That can trigger your pipeline. Your pipeline can then automatically pull code from Mendix um, or S3, depending on how, how you want to deploy. Um, take it through the entire process and along the way it can gather metrics so it can say it took this long to download the deployment package from mendix this is the the, the um, deployment id that we use in jira so tag everything with that deployment id so the container will be tagged with that id so that you have something uh, uniform throughout your entire process both on the on the admin side and on the, the actual infrastructure side it can get gather the metrics that's generated during build stage your your unit tests your code coverage automation tests, your security results all of that it can um, gather all that metrics send it back to jira as it as it gathers it you can say it went into qa on this date it passed qa on that date this is the person that said i'm good with this and signed it off and can say this um, project went into oops that's too fast the this project went into um, production on that date which all of that information can then go back into Jira, um, or if it, or if you want, you can write it to your conference page or whatever, wherever you keep your docs. So when you find out that there's a production issue, you can actually see, okay, this production issue is running, or is, uh, we found it in this container. Then we go back to Jira, and you can actually track and see if there's any issues there. Did the build take longer than it previously did? Is there some metrics out there? Is there maybe 100% code, 100% unit tests, but code coverage went down, which would indicate that new code was written, but not tested. Um, so unit tests look great, automation tests look great, everything passes, but you didn't actually test the new code. Or you can say the guy that, that signed off on QA or the person that signed off on QA just didn't do a good job of it. 
you can you can track all of that back and you can automate this entire thing without ever having someone having to go back and update it manually and take time you can automate that whole thing and then this is kind of where the power of or, and the fun side of of playing around with AWS comes now speaking of playing legos uh for those of you who read my bio yes i spend a lot of money on legos um a lot in comparison to what i uh, not a lot in terms of doesn't matter i like legos but that's kind of also why I like AWS because AWS is like a giant box of Legos. You have all these building blocks that you can play around with and build pretty much anything you want, depending on, you know, how big your, um, how much money you have in your credit card, because depending on what you, you play with, you can get kind of expensive, but you know, pick the right blocks and you can build some awesome stuff that's not that, that expensive. I want to look at the AWS wall now. Uh, I'm going to start with S3. So if you listen to um, one of our previous talks about 12 factor, you'll uh, know that we, um, we, we um, don't want to store anything on the container itself because if the container dies, it's gone. So we have our persisted stories in, in AWS three. So all the artifacts that gets generated by the application will go sit there out of, uh, off of the container. That's one of the things that we use S3 for. That's probably the main thing we use it for. Um, next up, is SQS. Now I know, so SQS is simple queue service. Um, S3, by the way, is just simple storage service. Um, so it's just uh, object storage. You can't, can't put operating systems on there. Anyway, SQS, um, it's queues. So Mendix has an internal queue implementation. Um, I believe it's called process queue now. It used to be task queue, if, if I'm not mistaken. I read through the docs of process queue in like 10 minutes. So I'm not, and, and I'm not an expert, but from what I understand from it is you can, it's a FIFO queue. So messages first in, first out messages onto the queue. However, um, and this is pretty much with any system. If you, if message one and message two gets pulled off simultaneously to be processed in parallel, if message two is processed faster than one, it can still be completed faster than one. So it's not, it's not guaranteed that pro, um, message two will only be processed once um, process one is completed unless you run single threaded. The one big thing about um, about the Minix implementation though is if a, if a failure occurs, it's gonna retry until it actually passes, which could result in um, messages being partially processed 50 times. Now, in general, it's not such a big, big, uh, big deal, but if you have something like an email send out process where the beginning of the process sends out an email and then does some other stuff, if that other stuff fails, it could end up that you send the same email 50 times to someone, which can get annoying. Um, SQS, however, is much broader than that. It, that's just a simple use case that it solves. SQS is just, it's, it's inf I almost want to say infinitely scalable. It's not infinitely scalable, but it, it, it scales to massive amounts. Um, AWS uses this internally. And if you go and look at the stats that they run at during something like a Black, Black Friday sale, it's incredible the amount of messages that they process within a day. So. Next up is Lambda. Lambda is a code execution environment. So you basically give it your code and you say, I wanna, this is Node or this is Python or this is Java, or you can actually specify own runtime and run it. Um, and Lambda will figure out where to run it, how to run it, and just go to run it. Um, it's a very, very handy tool to break away parts of your system. If, if, it, if there's a part of your system that causes load and it's not core to it, you can actually separate stuff out. Um, it's also very nice, handy for DevOps related functions and that sort of thing. So next up we have CloudWatch, which is simply put just a, a log um, location. Uh, CloudWatch is much broader than that. And now um, for us, we use it for two things, mainly logs, storing all of our logs, application logs as it's generated automatically gets pushed there. Um, and then the other thing we use it for is you can set up kind of like cron expressions that fire off events and you can schedule things like I want to deploy my code. I want to run uh, a code deployment every night at 11. You can do that with a, with a cron expression that you set up in, in, in CloudWatch. It's a pretty, pretty cool thing there. Then API Gateway. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail there. API Gateway is an API um, service or there's an API hosting service. I just wanted to point it out because we, we had an in, uh, interesting use case where we have a client that posts data to one of our Minix applications. Um, but we wanted to enforce certain of the, of the, of the rules that we have with them uh, in terms of the rate at which they can hit our application. We don't want to end up in a situation where 
they slam the application to bits and load just increases and we can't actually handle um, requests on the front end now yeah sure you can have a, um, a sla but you still want to do something from your side to prevent uh, uh, any of that happening so in our case we simply put down an, an api gateway and we said um there's a, a rate limit of two requests uh, per second or whatever the case may be and whatever requests come in we just take it and pass it through to the minix application but it's just it enacts as a barrier uh, between the outside world and, and the application and then we have athena athena is is basically presto uh, for those of you who know what presto is it, you can write sql queries to query flat files so you can write a sql query to query a json object or a csv file or a tsv file um, which is, is pretty cool um, then we have test text extract so that this is a, a service that can interpret pdf documents or, or other documents so if you have say financial statements and there's there's a lot of uh, tables in there you can grab all that information out with text text extract and then lastly what i just want to point out is recognition uh, which is an image and video um, recognition service. Uh, it can detect objects, text. Um, it can actually, these days, it can actually tell you if a person in the video or the photo has a face mask on, which is, you know, handy for some reason. So this is all the services, but I mean, this means nothing if you don't, and if you if we don't make it practical. So this is a, a normal application uh, that we have uh, a server uh, or a, a, a container running it connects to the database that blue thing at the bottom it's got s3 for storage at the back and we have logs going up to cloudwatch that pink thing at the top so let's say our users uploads files um, pdfs or images as part of the flow but we need to process that but we don't actually want the application to process that file because the file can get quite large so you can actually set up a trigger on your s3 bucket with um, once a file lands on S3, so the, the person will upload it, we will store it on S3. Once that file lands there, it can trigger a Lambda function. The Lambda function can then either call Textract or Recognition, so it process this document for me and store the text um, in a file on S3. Um, and then once it's done, Lambda can then put an item on a queue to say, or to, um, to let the application know that, okay, we've processed this document, the information is ready for you in S3, Go and grab it. You can you can now do whatever you want with the save it in the database or or process it any uh, further. So you just cut out document um, processing completely out of your Minix application. Uh, if it's not core cool to your application, but it's 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 something that that's needed, it's very nice to just cut it out and 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 stash it to the side uh, and interact back with it with with SQS. But now let's say you have an yeah, you have an issue. There's um, errors errors are starting to occur. Clients are complaining. The developers need to query that logs. Now, CloudWatch has some, some basic filtering uh, built into the front end, but you can also hook up Athena to that CloudWatch logs and you can query your application logs with SQL. And because of SQL, you can just store those SQL queries and your um, developers that's on support can have a, a, a basically a, a database of, not a database, but a stash of SQL queries that they can run to troubleshoot where can the issue, what, where might the issue be which saves time if you, if you don't have to go and dig for how to figure out how, um, what's going on. You can just copy a query, run it, and there you go. It's also, it, it queries quite fast. Um, so this is a very simple example of the little services that you can use that comes with, with AWS that I want to say um, you cannot do with Mendix because a lot of these um, services like recognition, like Textract um, and SQS, you can use even if your, your application is running in the Mendix cloud, um, but running it or using it alongside an application that's already running in AWS makes it a lot simpler for yourself. Uh, managing of it, securing of it, and um, when it comes to speed and that sort of thing, it, it, there's also there's a benefit there. So I would next want to look at architecture. Um, and when you look at architecture, there's about five pillars that you have to look at, five really important things. Um, I'm going to get back to that previous example just now, but yeah, so uh, sorry, I mean the citizen developer um, example. Anyway, five pillars. So you have operational efficiency. Now, operational efficiency, in, in when it comes to architecture, it's about architecting your application in a way that, or your, your infrastructure in a way that um, it's simple to iterate. There's issues, it's it's simple to to fix and, 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 and deploy 
any version of your infrastructure. It's it's about having versions of your infrastructure that you can quickly um, spool up and, and say, this is the version that we're currently running in production. What's wrong with it? Run it in QA or test it in QA or whatever the case may be. Um, there's a few more things, but those are the kind of the things I want to focus on right now. Then you have, uh, next up, you have security. Um, I don't think anybody needs a lecture on application security and data security right now, but I mean, that, that you have to, that is something that you have to keep in mind from day one when you're architecting the environment. Reliability is another one. Reliability is one where your use case will kind of de determine how, how deep you're gonna go into that one, but still you have to keep that in mind. Um, then you have performance efficiency. efficiency. Um, that's kind of self-explanatory. Slow application makes people mad and they'll stop using your application. Um, and then lastly is cost, um, which everybody these days with economic circumstances, it's an important one for everybody. Um, so coming back to our example of citizen developers, the, as I said previously, there's, there's things that you need to keep in mind when developing um, or when coming up with a new architecture. And as I said previously, some of these services that I mentioned, you don't actually need to be on the AWS cloud to use them. So if you look at putting that in an architecture diagram, that previous little example, this is kind of what it would look like your users with citizen developers, if it's internal, would sit inside your network. Um, so it's inside your VPC. Uh, VPC is just your vir virtual private cloud. It's basically your personal network inside AWS. Your applications can sit all within one network. It doesn't really matter. Reliability isn't, unless there's a lot of business users, it's not that if it's just a person kind of figuring out what's going on or developing something new, reliability is not that that important. If it goes down, just bring it back up again. But as I said, the services are sitting outside of your VPC. Uh, it's inside your AWS account, but it's outside your VPC, which means you can actually use it uh, if your application is running on the main cloud. But this is where it now gets interesting. So you can deploy a thing called an endpoint inside your, your, your um, network, which allows traffic between your application and a service like S3 or um, Lambda or SQS for that matter. It allows traffic between those two things, your application, that service to run within your network. So speed is better because it, it, only, it never goes out to the open internet that runs on AWS's internal network. Um, security never leaves your network. So you, it, it, it's obviously more secure. Um, and also when you get to the costing side of things, and this is more an issue when you get to scale, especially with S3, if you download large files or you have large files stored on S3, you pay data out transfer fees. So if your application pulls a file and it pulls it over the open internet, then the file will leave your network to or will leave your account to come back into your account. So you pay for every file that you pull. So running all of that inside your own network is obviously um, there's cost benefits there. Then this is more what a standard architecture would look like. Um, you would have separation of your web layer, your application layer, and your database layer. Um, and within those layers, you will actually have multiple networks or multiple subnets within the network uh, for high availability, where you would set up your network that if if you have a single uh, Manix instance running or a single Manix container, you would set it up in such a way that if for whatever reason the network goes down, it will automatically recover, come back up again. Um, or if you have multiple, um, if you have a license that allows you to have multiple containers running simultaneously, then you can actually just set it up that containers or the, you know, the containers or database instances don't um, launch two of the two of them in a single network, they are spread over networks, which means if one goes down, all the traffic will just be automatically routed to the um, still running instance. Um, and obviously, if you if you said your minimum has to be, say, two containers, and one goes down, AWS will automatically realize one is missing and bring it up in, in the third, say, um, sub network. So I mean, I can spend hours talking about this deep level architecture stuff. Um, I don't think that's too helpful though. So if you have any questions, we can we can get to that later. So I wanted to do a demo. <laughs> the problem is I closed the tab. So I'll, I'll just quickly show you what a, a CloudFormation looks like. I wanna get to CloudFormation next. Now CloudFormation is a is a tool that, or it, yeah, it's a tool that you can specify or, or you can build out your infrastructure in JSON or in YAML, pick your poison. Um, a lot of people prefer the one over the other. Um, I prefer JSON just because, again, doesn't really matter. But basically that entire network that I'm, I'm not gonna log in now, I'm not gonna actually show you the console. Um, 
that entire network ac uh, architecture that I that I showed you previously. I built all of that in this template. Now this is 500 lines. It looks like a lot because there's a lot of brackets. It's it's not all that difficult, but you specify everything that you need in this template, and you tell AWS this is my template. Run it, which means you can give it to any environment. You can run in QA, you can run in production, you can run in development. It will bring up everything you need. So you have replicatable environments, but changing something um, is simple. So let's say you want to switch from a Postgres database to MySQL database, and now um, you need to change the database engine. You need to change ports on the database, uh, on or at least ports on the firewall, ports on the networking. You can go into your file, you change it all in your file, change it once and you just run the file multiple times or the, the template you can give the template to CloudFormation multiple times for your multiple environments and it will go off and do that the cool thing about CloudFormation is just like you have an application pipeline you actually can put this template in a pipeline as well which means you can run tests on this template and ensure that it's fine um, there's no um, errors within in the template so as i said i'm not going to show you the console right now but you can you can put that in the pipeline which means there's a lot more quality and security around or security not that much quality around your your, your cloud formation templates you can have you can have your application and your infrastructure deploy to production side by side so let's say your application now needs a new sqs queue you can specify it in your cloud formation template and you can ensure that when your application code goes into production that template also goes into production so that that queue is there you don't have to deploy the one and then the other they can go in simultaneously there's a lot of power around that. CloudFormation is the tool that, that we use. Um, it's just one of the many. You can use Terraform. You can use whatever you want. Um, it, it, again, it, it's like IT. Pick your poison. It, it, it all depends on preference. Terraform is more if you don't want to be locked into AWS. Um, we're pretty much focused on that for the time being. So uh, that we just went with CloudFormation. So that's pretty much the demo. Um, or, or, or my presentation. I know I go through this quite quickly. There's a lot of information. So I know that there's going to be questions. Um, I'm going to get to the questions just now. I just want to say thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you guys. I apologize if I if I seem to look over my screen a lot. I have a monitor in front of me. I, um, so apologies for that. If you want to connect with me, if you have any questions that aren't covered um, in the question section, um, you can email me or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. If you do connect with me on LinkedIn, please just put it in the description that something descriptive. If it's the stock standard message, I generally ignore it. Apologies if I've done that to you in the past. Um, so I'm going to skip over concerns for now. These are the main things that you have to take into, not concerns, considerations, considerations that you have to take into account when deploying your Minix applications into um, your own environment on AWS. Um, but if you have any questions, that's basically next. Um, if you have any questions about this, go for it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend time talking about this. I want to leave some time for questions. Yeah, cool. Thanks, SJ. It's really good and really appreciate it. We've got quite a few questions, so I'm glad that we have time for you to get into it in a lot of detail. I'm just going to go through the open questions first, and then I'll go through the questions that were uh, addressed to the panels. So, um, to the panelists. All right. So, um, the one question that Patrick's asked is, can you use the AWS database file storage, or would you need your own SQL or PostGreq? I think it says Postgres or PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL. Yeah, I think so. So, um, so as I, I'm not 100% sure what the, uh, the question is. If you can clarify, that'd be great, but I'm just going to wing an answer. <laughs> um, AWS has. You think you have to use the uh, Amazon hosted database or can you use your own oh, database? Oh, okay. If you, I'm, I'm not sure if you can use the Mendix database itself. If you have a like an on-prem database, I'm, you can use that. You will have to set up your network in such a way that your application can connect to your on-prem database. Um, so you'll have to set up the network. You can either create a, a connection between your cloud um, network and your, your on-prem network. Um, there's ways to to speed up the the connection between that with direct linked um, direct link um, or um, peer to peer VPNs that sort of thing. Uh, so you will have to set up the networking between the two. There is obviously going to be some speed impact if you do that, but you can have if you have an on prem database and your application running in AWS, that is possible. Yes. Okay. Uh, Hank asks: Is there a limit to how much you can scale CPU slash memory? There is um 
I cannot tell you what it is off the top of my head. Uh, if I, I mean, if you look at the database, so you have database can scale and, and your application can scale. Database can scale, I don't want to lie to you, but I think it says it can scale to 64 gigs of, no, no, 64 gigs of around 120. The, 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 um, the Amazon serverless last time, or I haven't, yeah, the last time I used serverless Aurora, it scaled to, I think, 128 um, gigs, or it can scale up to 128 gigs of RAM or 265 gigs of, of memory. There's a new version of, of Amazon serverless Aurora, so that it might scale higher. If you use standard Aurora, there is some limitations, but it's quite high. Um, it, it's, and if, if you, that is if you use R instances, there's a lot of instance types. I don't want to hum and all a lot and, and, and speculate, but there's a lot of instance types you can choose from. Um, and if, if push comes to shove, you can install your database on a server yourself and run an X, an X database with terabytes of, of memory. But in terms of the application, again, if you run Fargate, there probably will be some limitations to that. Uh, if you run your own, if you run your containers on a server that you yourself host with something like ECS, um, ECS is container um, service, Elastic Container Service, which is basically you say, this is my server that I want, want to run my container on and Amazon will manage the kind of container um, orchestration on top of that. Then you have more control over the, the server itself. Then the server sizes can get insane. I mean, you can have instances with, with terabytes of memory um, and a lot of CPUs. The, the instance size gets, gets very large there. But there obviously will be some limitations at some point you will reach them but your your money will probably run out before that it's like inevitable that you will reach a limit somewhere but the limit yeah. will be extreme yeah. um yeah, yeah like your credit card's probably the first limit you reach so uh patrick asks can you use a load balancer or does aws make load balancing obsolete um can you use a load balancer so the example that i showed you doesn't have a load balancer uh, but the applications we run in production has a load balancer. Um, so your, your load balancer, if you have multiple containers, you will still need a load balancer to, um, to actually manage the load across your multiple containers, obviously. Um, there's some cool things. If you use an Amazon load balancer, there's some cool things that it can do for you. It can automatically register containers with a load balancer, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but it's, it's an optional thing for you. You can, you can use it if you want. You don't have to use it. Um, and again, I th I'm pretty sure you can use a an on-prem load balancer in, in front of your your Minix cluster or your your um, yeah your container cluster. Okay, uh, the next question is: Do you still store your code in uh, Team Center, or also use an AWS solution for that? We still store our code in in, in the Minix cloud. Um, I'm not. I'm. I know with. Uh, they announced Git support. So Amazon has Amazon does not have an SVN service for, um, but it does have a as far as I, as far as I know. Could be wrong. They release uh, new services at the rate of of light um, at the speed of light. But they have a Git uh, a service called Code Commit. I'm pretty sure you can store your code in there if you wanted to, um, but we don't. We we still use Minix um, to do that. Okay. Uh, and sorry, but I'm just want to say you can use that code commit or that Git repository. You can use as a source of your pipeline. You can use GitHub if you want to. You can, as I said, you can use whatever you want to. But code AWS bucket. has got a Git mm -hmm. repo you, um, service you can use. Yes, code yeah. commit. Yeah. Okay, cool. The next question is when would you advise to use AWS directly instead of Mendix Public Cloud? Oh, that's an interesting question. So, um, to give you an idea, we actually still have an application running or, um, on, on the Minix cloud, which is an internal application. We don't want to spend too much time on the infrastructure. Um, we just want this environment. We don't care about uptime. So it's a, it's, I think it's a, it's a non-licensed one. So, yeah, a sandbox instance. So we don't really care, care about uptime. It's like demos and that sort of thing. We still use the Minix cloud for that. Um, I think when your application, when you get to the point where you want more control over things like the database. Uh, you want actual direct access to the database because you want to run export jobs directly out of it. Um, if you want, um, I mean, there's, there's positives and negatives to that, but I mean, you can, if you, if you get to that point where you want that direct access to the database, then, then it's, an, it's, an, it's a good time to shift. If you want more flexibility in terms of, of technology that you use, um, or you want more, you want to play around with the AWS world and integrate that into your system, 
um, at some point it gets a little bit um, so for just a, a quick thing if you if you use the mainnext cloud and you connect to services in AWS you need to generate keys you need to generate um, a secret key and an access key and you have to actually store that in your application or in the application config and it's your responsibility to rotate that and all that if it's in the mainnext cloud if you run your application in AWS itself you can actually assign roles to your server you don't have to worry about rotating. So it's a little bit of a security thing. It's it's not a reason to move to AWS, but it's a nice thing to have um, in terms of security, improving that. I think one way to look at it, I mean, there's there's a lot of different de uh, levels of detail you can answer that question from. It's a very good question. Hmm. And um, it's actually one of the best ways to actually answer it is to read Wardley's maps um, because he actually does do, he has got a, a full chapter on how he breaks down what product is and what um, in, and the advantage you get from a product there and a product here. And when you should know, you should be shifting over to commoditized service, like what AWS uh, offers. Um, he gives a really great fundamental answer to it. I would recommend reading that one. Esther will probably give you, you get into a knot by telling, uh, I mean, there's so many on detail level. There's so many different aspects you can, you can take on that one. But I, I recommend checking that book out. It's free. It's on Medium. If you search Wardley's Maps book, you'll get it. And uh, it, it, it'll answer your question, I think. Yeah, Derek right. just saved you all like hours of me rambling on about ideas. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next question is, how would you approach fallback database setup right in there? Um, any thoughts on best practices? Yeah, so um, if you look at... at, at um, at Aurora, if you there's different database technologies, you have the main two is Aurora or not Aurora standard at uh, RDS, RDS relational database service. If you use Aurora, Aurora has try and say that fast. If you if you look at the service, um, it's actually architected in a way where your database instance and your storage layer is separate. The storage layer is automatically replicated across all of your availability zones that you deploy your your um, database into so you can have in say an island the island region you can have three um, availability zones so your storage will automatically be replicated six times across those three um, availability zones and the instance on top the actual database engine that sits in a single zone so if that engine goes down you can automatically recover it and it will come up but the, the data will still be there you'll you'll lose the transaction that was active but the, the rest of the data is still there and we'll just roll back the ones that that was in progress. Um, in terms of then saying, but what if the entire island region goes out? You can have cross-region replicas, which um, we've set up for for some of our clients, where you can have your main database in um, in, in, in say Ireland and your backup database in Germany, in in Frankfurt, um, or in America, or wherever you want it. So then. There's two ways of doing that. There's the, the global Aurora database, or you can have read replicas. Now the read replicas is, you can set it up to be less expensive, but there's a bigger lag, or global databases, which basically on the storage layer, um, it will transfer data. As soon as the data is written to the one instance, it transfers it over to the other one. And you can then set up your rules in, internally um, to say your networking rules, your, your DNS rules, that if the one database goes completely out, just switch over to the other region if you wanted to. All right, cool. Um, and then another question is, would you have more than one container, one for the app and the other for the database? No, so, well, I've never done it like that. Let, let me put it like that. I've never done it like that. Whenever uh, we run a Minix instance on AWS, we run, we use a, a service. We, or we use um, RDS, we use Aurora, or we don't actually use RDS, we just use Aurora. You can, Put your database in a in a in a container if you wanted to. Then you have to manage that container with a database in it. You have to manage the storage underneath, keep it up, um, update it, patch it, all that. If you use Aurora, Amazon takes care of all that for you. Obviously, you pay a little bit of a premium for that. You don't. It's not comparable or comparable to a actual standalone server. There's a little bit of a management fee. Pay it. Just pay it. Um, it takes away a lot of the headache. So I'm pretty sure you can set it up that way, but we don't. Okay, cool. Um, and then uh, we're almost out of time. So just one or two more questions and then, then that'll be it. Um, is the costing of AWS cheaper than managing your own servers in a data hub, not taking resources into account? So that's just obviously the actual... That is an interesting question. And sadly, I cannot answer that for you. Um, the only reason for that is 
I don't know what the costs look for, like for for um, managing your own data hub. Um, what I can say is AWS, you have to look at the costing aspect of it properly before you or, or during the architecture process. You can arch architect it to be very expensive, or you can architect your uh, your application or your infrastructure in a way to be less expensive. You also have to look at the application itself. Because if your application starts to bloat, it can cause your infrastructure cost to rise, depending on the infrastructure that you go with. So simple example, if your, your application um, read writes to the database increases significantly, that can actually push up your, your bill if you use Aurora. But if you use a standard RDS instance, it doesn't matter. Um, so as I said, I, I can't answer your question, but what I can say is when you when you do your architecting, when you do your analysis of an AWS environment, just pay close attention to all of the costs involved, not just a server costs X amount in a month. Look at the IO cost, look at the storage cost, look at the backup cost. Um, it, it's just something that you have to take into account. Right, cool. Um, all right, the, the next question is, could you really, could you just comment on the difference between YAML and JSON in your approach? Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, for me personally, I, I go with JSON because um, it's easier for me to work with it um, because of the brackets. Um, it's, it's simple for me to look at a file and to know, okay, cool. This thing opens here. It closes there. Now, something that I have to point out is I usually have a screen that's zoomed in quite a lot. So I can't just go and look down straight in the line and say, okay, cool, this indent started here and it's gonna end there. So for me personally, having that closing bracket, it helps me to know exactly where, where, the, where the array or the object started and then stopped. Um, the other thing that, that's also nice is, obviously you get, you get um, uh, what's it called, color coding or whatever in, in, in um, say an IDE or in a text editor. But if you use the AWS, code commit console where we code review our CalFormation templates um, that's not color coded. So I can't see, okay, cool, the array is in yellow and the headings are in pink or whatever. So it's just all black and white text. And especially if you like cut off sections, then it gets really complicated for me to actually do that review. So for me, it's a personal preference. That's the only reason why. All right, cool. Um, some more questions coming in now. Uh, before using AWS with Menix, what was the CIDC pipeline you used to prefer and which Minix tools you used to use while uh, deploying an app? So I think um, I can probably answer that because yes. before that we used Minix Cloud and SJ wasn't involved. So we just used the, the standard deployment process that Minix has offered and has improved through the, throughout the years, I'd say. Um, so I hope that answers that question. All right, cool. And um, let me just quickly check through this list to make sure we've got everybody. Okay, well, that, that is almost the last question. The last one is when will SJ be presenting again? And so we'll make a plan pretty soon. seems like it was very valuable to everybody. And I, uh, so I appreciate that feedback. Thank you for that. If you guys um, can just say if you want more, like do I have to go deeper or broader? Um, that will help me a lot in preparing because one of most of my feedback was you talk too fast when, when I pre presented internally, you talk too fast, but it's because I want to get through a lot of information. So if you prefer me get, going deep into a subject, just put it out there in my next presentation, I'll focus on that or other way around, whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe, maybe we'll do one. We'll, we'll just dive into that cloud formation example you were going to do and take it from there. That might be quite useful. Yes. Can do that. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think that brings us to the end of the meet, meetup. So thank you to everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for the participation and the questions um, and, the, yeah, and the feedback. And uh, once again, thank you. And uh, hope everyone stays safe, does well. Thanks. Thanks everybody.